Welcome back to another Seek a Psychology video. Today what we're going to be talking about is what kind of happens after the Olympics or what happens after any major competition in an athlete's career. As many of you will have noticed if you've ever gone and competed or if you've competed kind of semi-regularly, you'll notice like this post-competition depression or post-competition lowering of mood. It's a really normal thing. In certain sports, it happens more than in others. And um, particularly in strength sports, it tends to happen quite a lot. What we're going to look at today is two papers in particular that focus on this temporary lowering of mood following competition. And the funny thing about this kind of lowering of mood is it tends to be independent of whether you've won or you've lost. You could have had the best uh, competition performance of your life and you could still have this temporary lowering of mood for a week or, or so afterwards. So just start off with some terminology first. This definitely isn't a, a kind of display or a symptom of depression. This is a lowering of mood states temporarily. You might have a temporarily depressed mood state, but this is by no means a, a kind of general diagnosis of depression or anything along those lines. It's just this kind of temporary thing which comes in immediately following the competition or a day or two following the competition it tends to last for a very very short time period so it might be two three or four days and then it tends to leave us and we return to a, a normal level of of mood state following that in most of these studies they'll use something called palms so it's the profile of mood states in the first paper we're going to talk about they actually use something uh it's a profile of mood states for adolescents. It's just the palms that's been basically shortened down and simplified. They call it the, the Brunel University uh, mood scale. To be honest, they use it for brevity, right? So they use it because there's less questions in it. They think athletes are going to be able to respond more easily to it and it, it won't confuse them as much. In the case of this paper, the Lane, Lane and Firth paper, it actually takes away from the results of the paper because we've a, a limited amount of questions, we've a limited amount of, of mood states that we kind of we kind of assess during it. Um, so I think there's around 11 questions over the course of the paper. They only look at around six mood states and it, it just doesn't give us the detail we need. We see palms used again in the second paper. So this is Glaude, Boulter and McCall. I nailed that. Uh, they use profile of mood states, they use a few other of these kind of standard questionnaire based things to get an idea for where people are at, how they're feeling for certain moods, uh, are they feeling full of vigour, are they feeling angry, are they feeling confused, fatigued, do they have a large amount of tension um, or any kind of, of these depressed mood states. So a lot of you will have watched over the last number of weeks uh, a lot of the best athletes in the world competing at the Olympics for two or three weeks and then you see them kind of going off afterwards. You'll see them on social media probably on holidays or they'll have returned home. You get the kind of triumphant hero returning home from the Olympics. But realistically for a lot of athletes, the next kind of two weeks afterwards is going to be a pretty difficult time, right? In the case of an Olympic sport, they probably have a four-year cycle. If they weren't in the system prior to the last Olympics, then it might have been a, a three or a three and a half year cycle before they were onboarded. It's still a huge amount of time training and competing almost full-time or in a lot of cases full-time to try and just maximize this one single performance. Obviously, in that case, you think the level of satisfaction somebody has with their competition, with the performance themselves, will moderate this kind of uh, temporary, temporary lowering of mood. In reality, when we look at both papers, the performance or the level of satisfaction they have with their own performance really isn't the major moderator here. Um, although they, it, there is one or two things kind of interplaying with it. So in the first study here, it's a study called Performance Satisfaction and Post-Competition Mood Among Runners, Moderating Effects of Depression. What this study basically did is it took around 195, yeah, around 195 runners. They're all 10-mile runners. They were doing county championships in the south of England, so it's not an Olympic level, but it, it is still competitive athletes. They basically did a profile of mood states before, they did a profile of mood states afterwards. They also canvassed them for how satisfied with their own performance they were, and they looked at how good their actual performance was overall. As I said previously, they use a kind of a shortened down or an easier version of POMS, which was the Brunel University mood scale. It's basically a version of POMS used for adolescents. 
and what they're looking for is they're looking to see does the performance affect this depressed mood state afterwards what do they find well they find that the performance and the depressed mood state afterwards aren't really the important things what are the important things so well to be honest they're looking at mood states prior to the competition so mood states prior to the competition seem to be the main moderator for this interplay between level of satisfaction and our post-competition depressed mood states when they kind of delve into it a small bit more what they say is the results of the present study indicate that depressed mood is related to the intensity of the other mood responses and perception of performance satisfaction depressed mood is proposed to be a moderator of relationships between post-competition scores and performance satisfaction so in reality performance satisfaction isn't the major influence over this this kind of prolonged or or not prolonged but temporary depression and mood state what seems to be the thing here is that the level of mood we have before we go into the competition so if we have anger confusion fatigue if we have low vigor if we have signs of depressed mood states before the competition that's the main moderator here so it's very very likely in a competition such as the olympics that someone is going to have a certain level of anger they might have heightened levels of confusion they certainly could have heightened levels of tension uh, fatigue all of these things are going to be built up behind them so in the case of a major competition like this because you have so much unknown because you're very likely traveling to a country you've never been to before it's highly highly likely that this kind of post-competition depressed mood state could be present. Right, so we need to kind of break this down a small bit more. Obviously, if somebody has a great performance, they should feel better. If somebody has a bad performance, they should feel worse. So when we look into the literature a small bit more, we need to look at kind of more lab-based studies rather than more applied sports psychology studies. So this paper, Cloud, Bouchler and McCall, basically looked at bringing a group of athletes into a, a lab setting. They're not competing in the sport that they, they compete in themselves. They're just normal pe- people competing in a reaction time test on a computer. And what that allows us to do is it allows us to introduce two people in an identical circumstance. So none of them have experience in this situation. We know they're, they might be somewhat competitive or they have innate competitive traits. And then we get to manipulate the result. So the very, very easy thing about a reaction time test is you're talking about split seconds and you can really easily manipulate results to say or ensure that they know they've lost by or won by a certain uh, percent. So we have two conditions here or two conditions and then two pieces within those conditions. Obviously, we have a win and a lose condition and then we have a closest condition. So this is where the competition is told that they were very close to winning and then we have a decisive loss condition so this is where the their loss was decisive or their victory was decisive and it was by a large margin of error and nobody really feels done out by it right so two major things were tested here they tested testosterone and they tested cortisol levels they were just done salivary uh before during and after the competition Winners after the competition had higher levels of testosterone in both the closest competition and the decisive competition group. Cortisol levels were similar across winners and losers in the closest and the decisive levels, which is kind of to be expected. They're in a lab-based setting. Nobody has done it before. Everyone is somewhat tense. There's a level of competition. So the competition thing was was really uh, reiterated to them as much as possible. And then... The major thing we need to look at is mood afterwards. So mood is assessed using palms, but using a full palms this time. So the slightly longer questionnaire, slightly more intricate uh, answers and slightly more to be drawn from those answers. And what they found was mood. So the so mood was lowest or depressed mood was highest in the decisive loss group. The interesting thing is that there was no difference between the closest competition uh, condition winners and losers. So if you felt like you just barely lost or just barely won, there was no difference in cortisol levels. There was no difference in mood overall. The major thing here obviously is that these aren't competing in a sport that they've trained a long time for, but it does give you a nice little insight into just what's going on in terms of the, the kind of hormonal response around competition. 
This particular paper is called Hormonal Responses to Competition in Human Males. And in conclusion of this paper, they basically say that hormone changes are not simply generated by arousal effects, but are related to mood and status change. So I think when you do look at an athlete or if you're an athlete yourself and you have just gone through a competition or you've just finished competition, you're in that kind of week afterwards and you have this sudden realization that you have the lowering of mood states. Um, you don't feel great. You feel like you want to stay in bed. Well, obviously, if this is just a short term thing, you need to kind of firstly understand that it's a normal thing that's going to happen. If it's just happening for a day or two after competition, you can kind of just understand it's a hormonal response that I'm getting. It's because of all the things that were happening before. If you're a coach who's in that position and you say, okay, I have an athlete who is just about to compete. Maybe I need to check in with them a week or two afterwards. In reality, looking at both of these papers, what you need to be doing is making sure their mood state prior to competition is pretty good as well. So rather than really focusing on high levels of arousal and stimulation prior to the competition, if you're looking out for the athlete, if they have multiple competitions, multiple weeks or months in a row, if it's a long season, you really do need to be looking in and checking in with those athletes like, how are they feeling before? Do they have those not only level, high levels of physiological fatigue, which you're probably checking anyway, but are there high levels of psychological fatigue? Are they feeling like they have low mood before the competition? In the first paper there, as I said, that's the main kind of moderator of this lowered mood following the competition. So do check in with them. Make sure if you're the athlete themselves and you're a day or two out from competition and you say, oh my God, I'm so stressed about this competition. I'm really worried about this competition. I feel tense about going to the competition. Make sure you're taking steps to moderate those stress effects. Make sure you're you're being active in the reduction of that depressed mood and you should be much better off in the week or two after your competition. Thanks very much for watching on the Seek a Psychology side of things. We have a few more videos coming out in the next few weeks. And there's going to be a Seeker Psychology Masterclass coming out for the weightlifters very soon. So watch this space.